Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. We've got 10 seconds to go. Whoever's here is here. If anyone shows up late, hopefully they can catch up with the stream later. And we'll take it from there. So on these tables, I have somewhat precariously placed everything that I have found is helpful to making a suit of armor, mostly for LARP purposes, could be used for heavier combat purposes as well. Now, full disclaimer, if you only wanted to make a suit of armor and you didn't want to just buy anything else, all you really need is a good pair of pliers, your power cord, some manner of heat source to melt the power cord, and your plates. Everything else here is not strictly necessary. It is, however, the sort of thing I found that has made my life vastly easier in every way and shape form possible. So we'll start from the left and work our way across to the right. We'll just go through all those little items. I'll put a complete list up later at some stage in the form of a text file or something that people can grab. First thing, paracord. Now, I should say lacing. You could use any type of lacing you want depending on both your budget and your constraints in terms of how historically accurate you want something. You could use leather. You could use sinew if you're doing something that's back mounted to another piece of fabric or another material you could absolutely use sinew if you were so inclined if you're doing a more eastern style armor you could use silk these are all perfectly good options they're also kind of expensive options i like 550 power cord it's called 550 power cord because it has a break point of 550 pounds this is probably not going to rip out on you it is also made of completely unnatural materials. So it doesn't really rot. It doesn't really hold on to odors. If you need to clean it, hose is fine. I will say when you're buying this stuff, you can get it very cheap in large quantities, which is why I tend to buy it in these 1,000-foot spindles. 300-foot spindle will do you absolutely perfectly good, though, if you're just building one suit, and that's the only one you ever intend to build. You could probably get by with less. I just like having more. When you buy it, there's always two options. You can get it in a nylon and polyester mix, or you can get it with a nylon-nylon mix. I personally recommend nylon-nylon. It melts a little bit easier, which I'm going to go into a bit later when you're building things, because you actually have to, and I don't know if you'll be able to see this, melt the ends. Let's see if I can get that someplace where there's some contrast of the power cord to be able to build it, to make a little bit of a needle to push it through, and the other side, you kind of melt it, and you can see it there. You build almost a rivet. So there is a little bit of heat treating and melting going on there. So that's important to note. And the nylon just burns a little easier. It melts a little easier. It's a little easier to manipulate. You'll know if you have a nylon-nylon mix when you actually are applying the heat to it. It'll smell kind of like burning celery. Strange but true fact, the things you learn. I do recommend, I don't have it out on the table at the moment, when you are heating and working with essentially melting plastic nylon, have a bowl of water handy that you can put your hand into. At some point, molten hot nylon is going to get onto you. If you try to rub it off, you're going to burn yourself worse. It sticks to you and it just keeps burning. Put your hand immediately into the water. It cools off instantly. You can pop it off. You won't even have a mark the next day. This is an important safety tip. Also, you use that water once you're done shaping this. You've got done shaping this to the way you want it. It's fine enough point. You can take this and go, this is going to go directly into my plate and come out without a problem. It doesn't stop. It doesn't fight me. Put it in the water. It's exactly like quenching any other sort of hot material. It will immediately cool off. It will harden, and it will hold its shape. Exactly what you want. So... That's our talk on the lacing side of things. Next thing I obviously need is plates. And you can get plates in every conceivable manner you want. Now, you could make your own. There are ways to do that, and I will discuss that later when we get into vendors. I like to work primarily in either plastic or aluminum on the basis that they are weight efficient. They, you know, it's the lightest materials you're going to get. They're durable. They tend to not have problems with rusting and oxidization. They don't have problems of rotting. They don't hold on to odors. So for LARPing, these are all good qualities. Again, you want to clean it off, take it out back, apply a hose. 
So I have here a variety of different styles of plates, different colors of plates, different textures of plates, and different materials of plates. And this is essentially my big sample bar that I bring with me to events. And someone says, hey, can you make me a suit of armor? I go, okay. What color, what style, what size would you like? Look at this. You can make your own. Uh, if you want to do plastic, easiest way to do it, get a bunch of garbage bins, mark out a pattern on it, cut them out. It's time intensive, but you can do it. And for what you save, I'm not a big proponent of it, but some people swear by it. So that's up to you in terms of your value and your time. Because remember, your time absolutely has value. So if you're going to be spending 12 hours going and cutting out plates versus saying building a suit that takes 15 hours to put together, well, you just doubled your time on that build. So how much is your time worth per hour? That's up to you to decide. I personally would rather just say I'll pay the you know, 25 or 30 cents per plate and buy them packs of 100 at a little bit of a discount and go from there. Would you like me to talk about where we can buy these, which vendors now, or talk about that later? Can hold on for a second, see if anybody has a preference here in the channel. And feel free to shout out at any point in the chat channel here, guys. I am keeping an eye on it. I can answer any questions as we go. Uh, all right. I'll talk about that later when we get to vendors and buying things. The one type of plate I don't have represented here is leather. I'm not currently working on anything in it, but you can get it, and I will talk about where to get that. After plates, you need some manner of good steel shears that you can just snip nylon with, do the occasional bit of leather trimming with. I don't often use them, but they're good to have. Rapid rivets. This is just a simple little rivet setter, variety of sizes and colors. Every now and then, you can just hammer something together, and it works. Moving on. Good ruler, preferably one with three sides like this, so you can put it on top of things and hold it flat. Get your measurements. One of these cutting mats. This is what they call a rotary cutting mat. And you can get a rotary cutting tool, which is really useful if you're using thin leather for doing borders with. But for me, and this is a small one, we actually have a very large one that's like 96 inches. You can actually sit and start lining up plates on these and say, oh, well, what do I want to do with this today? And figure out how many does that take? Well, I know this person has a 42 inch chest. I can go 42 inches across and just sort of lay it out and say, oh, so this is exactly how many plates I would need to do that. This is how I can lay that out. And then if you want to start doing inlays or other things, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you can do that there. So one of these mats, ideally in as large as you can get it, I wouldn't recommend, well, it's hard to say because I like this small one because this travels with me. I can take this two events with me. It packs easy. So the 18 inch isn't bad, but it's not what I would say use for your main build space. Try to get something that's going to have a reasonable measurement of 42 or 48 inches. If you can get a space that has a 96 inch mat, even better. Because the more real estate you have to devote to it, the easier your life gets. This is a total luxury. You don't need it. I like it because I have this need to be overly precise in my measurements. Good pliers. If you have a pair of pliers that must have flat edges, no teeth. Make sure they're comfortable in your hands. I recommend having at least two pairs. This is really just going to save you all manner of grief. These are the exact same pliers I use for doing work with chain mail, so I know they're comfortable for my hands. You really just have to find a pair that fits for you that are just going to not leave you going, oh my god, I have hand cramps for days afterwards. You, you don't want to deal with that, trust me. Moving on. Obviously, some kind of measuring tape, just so you can measure yourself or the other person that you're going to be building a suit for. Some heat source. Now, I mentioned before that you have to melt the ends on the paracord. There's a couple of ways to do that. Some are more efficient than others. Some are not really as good for people if you live in small spaces like I do. My personal preference is I just use a candle. I've been using the same rum bottle for about 10 years now <laughs> that I just stick a candle in and I can melt paracord over it as I need. 
and it provides good steady heat. It absolutely melts it very quickly and I can do what I need with it. So that works out perfectly well. Candle, great option, stores well, lasts pretty much forever. I mean, you really can't say anything wrong about it. Candles work great that way. That being said, candles do only last a couple of hours for use and then you have to buy more of them. So it does add to your expense. It's small, but it does add up over time. Your standard lighter, you can use it in a pinch. I found it doesn't generate enough heat. Uh, if you have a butane lighter, those work better. Now, at the high end or the uh, the high end of the spectrum or the deep end of the pool, depending on your metaphor, we're mixing them today. This is what they call a butane pen torch. And essentially, this is a lighter's big angry older brother, where you can take this and this will absolutely generate heat just by snapping that down and that would send out a small flame which you can adjust to whatever strength and width you'd want. This is a fantastic tool. The problem for me is that I live in an apartment in a city, so I don't have a way to store tanks of butane. If you have a house or you have a workspace that allows you to store you know, volatile gases like that, this is probably your best bet. Butane pen torch, really fantastic tool. Little E6000, every now and then you gotta stick something together. Usually this is on borders with fringe, just there. I'm gonna hold off on these till the end. These are your stamps, or rather your hollow punches, I should say. And hollow punches and leather cutting tools are a big part of this process because you have to build straps. You have to occasionally chop holes in leather to be able to put lacing through it. Just so to say, I need to go and say, oh, well, I need to bridge two pieces together. I need to make a belt strap. You're going to need hollow punches. And you can just take this, put it on your leather, rubber mallet. Make sure you have a self-healing mat. Bang. And you can knock out holes any size you want from one-tenth of a millimeter to ten millimeters. I didn't think I would use the ones at the extreme ends when I first got this. I thought I would only be using the ones that are the exact size I would be needing. I was very wrong. <laughs> the small ones are great if you're ever bridging other materials. Uh, for You know, you might say other media, but if you were bringing chain mail into it or scale mail that you wanted to bring and hang off of things, those small hole punches into bridging pieces of leather are fantastic. If you're going to sew something to your armor, those small holes are great. If you need to go and put some sort of Bezgu or big hand hang dangly parts or something on there that you want to hang some swag on it. Maybe you're the sort of person who wants to build that big priest of Sigmar purity seal. You'll want the big ones too. So those are great. Hollow punches, these are relatively inexpensive. You can find them on most hardware sites. This one I think I got through Etsy. I know I just did a look this morning. You can find the exact same set or similar enough made out of you know high carbon steel on Home Depot or Lowe's, they're available, easy to find. Move that off the table to give ourselves a little bit more room here. This one, however, was a bit of a specialized tool that I had to buy through Tandy Leather. This is for cutting out belt holes. So you'll see this hole here, not really showing up so good down there. We have that one long one, if I can get that so you can see the contrast. That's for if you're putting a buckle in here, that way that snap on the buckle has somewhere to go. So this was a specialized tool I had to buy. It was a couple of dollars on at Tandy. I shouldn't have worn a black shirt today. So overall, not too big of an investment, but it makes your life very good because it makes these nice clean cuts every single time. And that's what you want. You want something which is going to perform consistently. As I said, rubber mallet. You don't want a regular steel hammer for this. It's too much force. If you're hitting your punches and stuff, you're going to crack them or you're going to damage the sharp edge at some point. Rubber mallet. This is also good if you get stamping tools and you want to say, you know, put your, you have your little dragon or pixie or whatever stamp you like. You can tap that. This is going to have the right level of force for that and is not going to hurt it. These are cheap. They're everywhere. You can find them. Now... Getting into the leather side of things, one thing that I do want to talk about is templates. You can see here I have my 
template here for just making the sort of belt style loops that I'm going to attach. This would get built directly onto the armor and have a buckle in it. There'd be a D-ring in the back here, and then another piece could come through and essentially be the belt. Build templates. I built this. I was building these every single time and losing my mind. I finally got smart and said, I'm going to build this once, and every time I need one, I'll copy it. It never changes. So building out templates is the best thing I can ever tell you to do. Once you find a design for something that you use a lot, and I do the same thing for shoulder joints on armor, for the belt joints on armor, absolutely build templates. And that doesn't just go to the attachments on the armor as well. If you wanted to do colors, so I have like three different colors of plate and lamellae here, scale here. Well, what colors do I want to do? If you do this on the fly and you're building really intricate sort of patterns, you're going to find yourself having a bit of a rough time. Because at that point you're going, well, wait, I'm one off. You're, you're, you're five things in and you're doing it one row at a time, but then you're off by one and it's infuriating. That is something I don't want anyone to ever have to experience. So with that in mind, if you take an afternoon, take your scales, get the large format graph paper. You can find it very easily at most big office shops. Trace it out. Do one whole sheet. And do it for every type of plate you have. I have one for every single different size from different vendors. I've done at least one of these. Go to your local copy store. Run off 10 or 20 copies. And once you're done with that, have some fun with crayons. Grab some crayons. Grab some markers. Say what colors are complementary. What works. What looks good together. And the nice thing about it is you can get some really good results out of that. Uh, we'll switch the scene here quick. And you can see here, you can start getting some really intricate, well, this is how we pattern this row by row. And when you're building this, you're building laterally. So now you can actually say, well, I'm going to make these nice inlay patterns and really do some fun stuff with that. So building out templates lets you do great, great stuff. Bring that back off. Now in terms of actual armor, this is an earlier suit of armor. This is one I made for my wife. And we're just going to discuss sort of what goes into it so we understand the different elements here. When you're building this, you're typically building a cross. You're going to do all your rows, and then you're going to bring those rows together. You're going to have some form of attachment at the shoulder, either by lacing more plates all the way around, or by building a bridging piece of leather like this did. This is an earlier suit, as I said, so this actually uses just D-rings and we lace it on, almost corset style. Later suits that I made were using actual buckles to buckle that in. So you can do it that way. Either one works. It really depends on the level of movement, the level of contact, what you're looking for. The buckles, I will say, are 100% stronger, 100% more durable, and 100% more reliable. So that's why I moved over to these completely. This still does work, but you'll see it loosens up a little bit over time if you're running around. One thing I should also make mention of is we used a couple of different lacing patterns on this, and this particular vendor specifically made their lames to be able to interact with one another. So this is two different types of plates here. We have an A plate and a D plate. We'll go into that in a little bit in a minute. And they were built and engineered specifically so that you could interchange between them and get creative with it. And it works really good when it works. Not all vendors do that, so be careful. Other elements of this particular suit of armor, you can see we have the leather borders. That's something you can do in addition. It isn't strictly necessary. It's nice, but it's not strictly necessary. And my channel is having an issue here. Hold on a moment. There we go. 
back to my dashboard. So the leather border looks great in terms of live action role playing. Is it strictly necessary? No, absolutely not, but it looks really good. So again, very thin leather, hollow punches, measure out where the holes are. You can make a simple template out of it and then you're good to go. And that's pretty much all the elements of what we're doing here. So at that point, having talked about that, I can get that out of the way. I can bring this into play as well, just so you can see a bit of a difference. That whole suit was made out of aluminum. This suit is actually all the plastic plates. Now these are plastic plates that were done in kind of a pewter and a copper and a silver finish. So they're kind of metallic. They've got some texture to them. But it meets that from 10 feet away, it looks real. And that's a big thing that I like to promote is I don't really want to have something that looks like a collection of poker chips. That red and black suit is matte finish. It's kind of a matte finish on the red and the black and a glossy metallic finish on the gold. The golds are in fact this exact plate. So it has a little bit of play to it and adds a little depth of color. So let's actually go and show what happens when you have to build some armor here. Now that we've had everyone kicking around this long about all the things that go into making armor, we can talk about actually making armor. What a notion. So here we have your classic A plate or a tombstone plate as it's kind of called. I'd like to point out that you can have two of the exact same plate and have them be completely different. So these are all considered the same type of plate, but you can see they're three different sizes, and one of them has a completely different hole position on it. So the lacing pattern changes now. The side to side is the same, but the topmost part is in fact horizontal, not vertical. So you wind up with a completely different lacing pattern. And we're gonna use the aluminum plates for this today because I think they show up a little bit better on the camera. We can show off how this works. And I'm going to grab those D plates as well, just because I would like to have all my elements. Now, I've already prepared a piece of paracord in this lovely emerald green color with a forward end, which has, let's see if I can put this over here so you can actually see it. One end, which is kind of your rivet, and that's going to be the flat part that catches and one end that is nice and thin and is your needle. So needle and rivet. Ideally, when you flatten this out, what you wanna see happen is this should go into that hole just like that, completely seamlessly. It shouldn't fight you. You should just go through and pull through. And at that point, you've got your first piece. Now, there's a couple of different ways to do this, and I'm gonna try to show you both of them. Some people will argue the historicness of uh, if it's over under, if it's all just layered to one side, what's the lacing pattern, should they be pointing up, should they be pointing down? The answer is every single culture all over the world has done it some way. It's not ever wrong. It may not be accurate to what you in particular are trying to do, but it's never wrong. So don't worry too much about that. If you get three people who want to discuss the historical accuracy of any suit of armor in a room, you'll have seven opinions in five minutes. And that's fine. We're here to do this for live action role playing. So we aren't going to be as concerned about that. Now I'm going to try to show you two different lacing patterns here. This is sort of the across lacing pattern. So you'll see here what I'm doing here is I'm actually going and bridging across and up and down and across and up and down. This works perfectly good and makes a pretty good solid feed on it. The other thing you'll notice I'm doing is I'm actually going over under on these tombstone plates. This just allows for a little extra space when you're doing this lower portion here to do that bridge. Now I can do it the other way where I just stack it. And we say, fine, we're just going to build a stack. And I'll try to keep doing this. Over, 
under. It's going to look a little odd because right now it's not attached to any other horizontal layers. So they always have a bit of a hard time remembering their pattern as they go. So I said I was going to stack this. This is what you get sort of like, you can think of it as a cascading stack. And I can show you a really good example of that in a moment because I have some pieces I pre-made. So when you're cascading, it literally is one goes on top of the next, one goes on top of the next, one goes on top of the next, and it just keeps going in that direction. And I was doing an over-under pattern, that's right. So I'll bring this back over here. It's going to look a little odd because we changed things midway. But just so you can get an idea of what's happening here. Oh, under, over, under, over, and then we switch to cascade, cascade, cascade. So that does that. Now the other lacing pattern you can do, and this is with the D plates, but it works just as well in the back there, is you can do this 45 degree angled as you go on the back. Now you can see I switched directions on that doing that one when I did it. You don't have to, you can, it honestly doesn't matter either way. When you look at the front, the front remains exactly the same. So no change there. Uh, one thing I can note I did on this is you can see the alternating direction of the D plates. That was really done more for aesthetic purposes for me. You can't have them all going one direction, but I felt it looked a little dull. I liked having something which gave a little bit of a flow to it. So I like that. And of course the leather border on the top. Now I can go and show you this is the set what that pattern looks like for that over under when you actually get more than one row attached. And this is what it looks like on the back and you can see that over under pattern here. Down one over up one over down one over up one over. Or you can be doing that same I bridge down I go up I bridge down I go up I bridge down I go up and you can do that all the way across. I will say when you get to the end it's always good to end in a cross and then come back just for that little bit of extra tension. It, it locks it in. Now the difference between those D plates I just showed you on the back versus these A plates is these had that wider hole. So you have to sort of build this odd, well not odd, but it has a different need in order to do the bridge between two layers of plates. So that's really what you need there to build that. Actually, I can go back and show that too. You can see the same thing here. This is with the Wisby plates, and these are in plastic, not in the aluminum. But you can build the exact same thing. Cross, 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 or over, 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 over. And it looks exactly the same from the front. Just your basic example of how that works. So, since we were doing with the A's, and I mentioned this before, one of the nice things about this particular vendor is it all matches up. And we'll go completely to the over-under here, I think, just so you can see it. See it happen live, as it were. Now, you'll see what I'm doing is I'm pulling that tight, and I put my thumb here. That keeps the tension on the cord. So then when I go to the next one, I don't get any of that slack coming back to it. I prefer to build these sort of early style, more rigid suits. There's still plenty of give in them. They're still going to contour very nicely. But, let's see if I can do this in a way that you'll still be able to see it. I find if it has a lot of slack and a lot of plane, it just doesn't sit right later. So now you can see I'm building with that 45 degree slant into the pattern. Yeah, I allotted two hours for this and I think we're gonna finish a lot sooner than that, but that's okay. Everyone can get on with their day. So you can see these two styles of plate made by the same vendor 
they integrate really nicely. And then when we come out here, you can see again, integrates very nicely. And I could have put that behind this to give it a little bit of a nicer look. It would have been a little more aesthetic, I think, if I did it from that direction, but still works very well. And this is what you're going to do. You're going to take your measurement of whoever it is, you're going to build, say, okay, well, I need so much to get across the chest, so much to get across the body. Now, at that point, you have some decisions to make. And this becomes, how do I want to do that? Do you want to make one long piece and have one set of buckles on one side? This is a great option if you deal in a more heavy fighting game. Some of the latex games this could also be beneficial for because that means you only have buckles on one side. If you're a shield fighter, you can keep those buckles over there. They're not going to get hit. They're out of the way, and this is all one solid piece of armor. Good stuff. Uh, you can do side buckles if you tend to be a little more independent. That way you can reach your own buckles. If you're someone who fights in a heavier system and you have a squire, put them in the back. Everything will look great from the front. Have someone else tie you up. So those are decisions you need to make. You can also start to think about, do you want to build other items in this, like shoulders and other such. So I have some examples of that, and of course they didn't queue up where I wanted them to. What I can do is I can pull this up while we're talking about it, and I can find those other examples. So this is just a quick and dirty sort of look at how many different types of plate there are. And this is from a fantastic book by I believe it was Brent Thordman. Not what I wanted to do. Uh, come on. <laughs> this thing's going to fight me every inch of the way here today. What? Use current. Escape. Hold on. I'm sorry. There we go. There's the file I'm looking for. So that book is by... Yes, Banked, Banked Thordman. And it comes from a book called Armor of the Battle of Wisby, Visby, Visby 1361. It's a fantastic book. It's probably the greatest resource for lamellar armor and construction that currently is out there. It's also really, really hard to find. It was originally written in 1939. There was a reissue in 2001. It's very expensive. If you happen to have the good fortune to live near a major city with a large inner city library, you can usually find a copy. And when I say very expensive, I'm, I've done some looking into it. You can find copies on Amazon used for the 2001 edition for $300 and up. I personally don't want to spend that much money. But since I live near New York... I was able to go to the New York City Library. They have two copies in their library system, and they will let you look at them in the reading room. So there's at least one place. If you're on the East Coast in New York's orbit, I'm sure other major cities have it as well. The other good book that is much easier to find and still a great resource that references back to many sources within Mr. Thordman's book is Armor Never Weary, Scale and Lamellar Armor in the West by Timothy Dawson. This is also really great because not only does it exist in paperback format or hardcover format, rather, you can get it for the Kindle. So an electronic copy is always a good thing if you're on the go and you're looking to move around. Well, I'm still looking for that suit. Right, I think I found it. So here we have shoulders that we can build in. And here we built a bit of an articulation into the shoulder. So this was done by attaching a single point right there with the, the lacing. So using the lacing for that single point of attachment and underneath here we had a piece of leather, one inch leather, that attached here. And then we put the hole punches in a little short and attached it here. So one point in the back, one point in the front, and one point there going down, guiding it down the arm. And what you wind up with is a really nice looking articulated shoulder. This is a, probably a better image. That will just really just hangs very nicely and manages to maintain that shape. But keep that nice big sort of chunky look. If you want that, 
big shoulder look, this is what that winds up looking like when it's actually completed. So you can see there's the part that's going across, there's the point of articulation on each side. You can't even see the guiding strip of leather which comes down. This final piece isn't attached with any of the lacing, but does have one point of attachment here in the middle. So that just hangs. And it allows a full range of movement. It looks really good. And that was the suit of armor that came with me to Germany to fight in Drakenfest. Held up great in spite of Schlamageddon, as it was so called, with all the mud and the adverse weather and the cold and the wet. So it, the armor proved itself very well under adverse conditions. So at that point, I feel like we've kind of gotten through the basics of that. It really is that easy. It's just taking your time and going through it. Choices you need to make. Let's talk about some vendors, where you can buy things, and what kind of modifications you would need to do, as those are all going to be important things if you don't want to make your own. And I don't want to leave people having to go and do the hours of searching on Google that I did for no good reason. If I'm not, if they don't have to, let's not make you do that. So I'll put some stuff in chat here, and I'll add it later on when we get to the YouTube side of things. So first off, the books I mentioned. The first is this one. Armor from the Battle of Visby, 1361 by Bank Thordman. And you're going to be looking for the 2001 edition of that. I think there's actually a second issue of that as well. So if you can find it on your intercity, that's great. It's one of the great resources for making Lamellar, but also it's in English as well as in, I believe, German. So depending on what you can read, the other book you're going to want is that one, Armor Never Wearies by Timothy Dawson. That is available in an electronic format. Fantastic resource. Now, in terms of where to buy lames, I'll take that in a couple of parts. There's four basic sources that I can give you. These are the ones that I would suggest. Uh, the first is for aluminum and steel you're looking at a company called Elsfjord Trading. And Elsfjord Trading made these. These are the ones that are engineered to fit together so you can mix and match, a lot of fun there. He's based in Pennsylvania, so for me, he's a local person. If you have a local person who is in your area that can provide this for you, please support them. As long as they're making a good product and it's well-made, you'll save on shipping, it'll get there sooner, and you know, you're helping local artisans. Always a good thing. I've had no issues with these plates. I've had nothing but success with these plates. They have a great quality of craftsmanship. They have a great consistency. So nothing but positive things to say there. In terms of the plastic plates, I've got two vendors. And I can probably bring some of these out here just so you can see some of the differences. One, two, and one, two. So on what is my left, these are from Plastic Lamellar, and almost all of these plates on this string are from Plastic Lamellar. They do a Newcastle plate, they do an Auk plate, they do a D plate, a Visby plate. They also do an Effingham plate, which is more of what you'd see people using for a samurai style plate for Eastern sort of things. I don't like working with it personally, but I just don't enjoy using that lacing pattern. Plastic Lamellar has been a fantastic vendor. They've done very well by me. And I will say they really look out for the people who follow them. Hey, thank you for the follow there. Got our twinkle music. Things I can say about Plastic Lamellar. One, the level of production is extremely consistent. I have never had a failed awk plate. I have had one failed Visby plate per maybe 500 that I get. So production flaws, non-existent. Consistency of the holes in terms of smoothness and bore, perfect. Consistency in terms of dyeing, again, about one in 500, you might get a transparent one. They've been really good. The other thing that I can say as a bit of an anecdotal story is I buy a lot of plates, as you can guess. They do a discount based on bulk purchases. Now, I'm not 
sitting there doing the calculator on the math. I trust their widget on their website. One time I made a large purchase and about a month later, I got a call from Noble Plastics. They're the company that they're based out of. And they said, hi, is this Daniel? Of course I said, yes. And they informed me that I had been owed a bulk discount, but it hadn't been reflected in the purchase and that they were going to be crediting that back to me. So they actually went out of their way to contact me and give me money back, which really means a lot to me as a customer. I think that's great. Um, one other nice quality of life thing they do is every single type of plate they make on their webpage. And let me post that into chat. They have a PDF with the specific instructions on how to lace it up. So you're never going to be lost in the dark. You don't have to go and find videos like mine showing you how to do it. They tell you how to do it in a really easy to follow PDF. And that's great. So very good. It's very new armor friendly. They have a great utility on their webpage as well, where you can say, I am this tall. I am this wide. These are my chest measurements. These are my hip measurements. And it will calculate how many plates you need. It's usually high by about 100 or so. But I'd rather have more than need to buy more and have to pay for shipping and wait. So a lot of good things to say about them. They've been great. The other company I have here is Valkyrie Forge. They're a newer company. And the one thing they're doing is they're making a couple of different styles of plates and all of their plates come in this lovely uh, textured pattern. When you look at the plastic lamellar plates, uh, the Newcastles, they're flattened kind of matte. The Aux are not textured, but some of them have that metallic sort of sheen to them. They do have that just flatness to them, which isn't bad, but if you're looking for something that has that texture, like on that suit of plastic armor that I showed earlier, the texture is really nice and it adds a real nice depth to it when you're out running around. They also finish theirs in a high gloss finish, which if I hold these two side by side, maybe we can see this in the camera. A little bit. You can see that the D plate here, ha they're both gold, but the D plate has a slightly more subdued finish, whereas the A plate has a very high gloss finish. So if you want something that you're out in the sun and it's going to attract attention, Valkyrie Forge is making a good product. Um, the only things I, 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 I like plastic lamellar a little bit better because they do provide the instructions for their lacing patterns. Now I'm familiar enough with them that I can usually figure it out. And I did, but if you're new to it, you might get a little confused. Uh, the other thing that I found is sometimes, uh, with more frequency than I was happy with, you would find there might be little rough edges or hunks of plastic hanging off or the holes weren't completely board out. And I think that's just more of a production issue from the early runs of stuff they're doing. So far, they've been great. They've been very responsive when I brought concerns to them. So they're a good company as well. You really can't say anything bad about them. Now, the last place I want to talk about is somewhere you'll probably be buying more than just plates and other things from is Tandy Leather. And let me put Valkyrie Forge in chat so you have that. Now, Tandy Leather is huge in America. I'm not sure if they're in Europe so much, but you can probably find similar stores. They're an all-purpose leather working and leather goods shop. You can get stuff for making bags, for making moccasins, for making saddles. People have been using Tandy to fight in the SCA for years using Oxide. They're fantastic. It's where I bought uh, the leather belt punch tool. It's where I buy all of these pieces of leather. Any of my leather goods, I get through them. One thing you can buy through them, and I'm going to put a link to this directly. Actually, I'll just pull it up in another browser, I think. See if I can do that so I can show you what we're looking at here. And I'll change the viewpoint. Is if you go on to Tandy Leather, and I'll switch this so you can see it. So it was Tandy Leather having a Super Saturday sale. Woohoo! There's actually one very close to my house, so that's exciting for me. What you need to look for is practice. If you do a search for practice pieces, you'll find these. Now, what you've got here is essentially a pre-made blank lamellae plate. And that's kind of cool. If you get those hollow punches I was talking about earlier, you can put any whole pattern you want. If you recall that big image I had up earlier, which shows like the 50 or so different varieties of whole patterns and types of scales from around the world. You can buy these. They're a little expensive. A pack of 100 will run you about 60 or so dollars. 
as opposed to a pack of 100 of the plastic scales, which will run you usually 24 to 30 dollars in US dollars. So this is twice as expensive, but you can pattern it how you like. So I felt that was worth putting out here because at one and a half inches wide and three and three quarter inches tall, they really do fit into that perfect kind of size. You can dye them. So if you wanted to get leather dye, say, well, you know what? My character has to have this particular colors and whatnot, and you don't see that pre-offered in the plastic because the plastics are usually where the colors are at. This gives you an option to really flex your creativity, both in terms of color. You can carve patterns into it. You can paint it. If you're really going to go into that deep end of the pool for saying, I need something really different and I want to build it myself from scratch, this is an option. It's an expensive option, but still an option. But you have to look for practice pieces. That's where they're going to sell those as. And they sell those in packages of 10 or packages of 100. You can buy them in the store. Tandy does have a loyalty program where you can be like a gold member and buy a membership and that price drops to I think like $39. So if you have a membership and you're in there buying enough stuff over the course of a year, it, it can pay for itself. So that's a good thing to have. Uh, in terms of any other vendors, we talked about DIY. Oh, Paracord. We didn't talk about where to get paracord. We talked about type of paracord where I said you want 550 paracord. The place I get all my paracord from is this vendor, Paracord Galaxy. And the nice thing about Paracord Galaxy is you can buy it in little 100 foot bags or the 300 or 1000 foot spindles like I use. I find the 300 foot spindles are the easiest thing in the world to work with because it makes storage a lot easier. It keeps it from getting messy works out really well. So that kind of covers all the basics here. We've covered all the tools and materials you need. We've covered basic lacing patterns. We've covered some safety and pro tips. We talked about making templates. We've gone over all the vendors. Uh, if anybody in chat has a question or has anything they'd like me to show them how to do it, I'm happy to go and show that off. Pardon me as I drink some tea here. I've been talking for almost an hour. All right. So no questions in chat. One thing I can talk about is this is a great activity to do if you have a team or you have a group of people that you play games with. These suits can take, uh, depending on the level of complexity, between 15 and 45 hours of actual work to create, and that's excluding any templating or working you're doing. But since you're building each of these sections individually, you can divide that up between a lot of people. One of our friends who was coming with us to a game needed a suit of armor. We had three of us. It took us, I believe, four and a half hours of total work between three people to build an entire chest harness and shoulders in the course of one afternoon and a couple of beers. So you can really kind of just make that an afternoon effort. Many hands make light work. So keep that in mind if you ever say, hey, we want to go somewhere as a unit. We want to look regimental. I think you can do some great stuff there. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Creative Corvus. Yep, and if anyone ever has any questions about this, please do feel free to reach out to me. I will be happy to go and provide any assistance or guidance I can. I've got two suits of armor I'm building right now that I'm trying to get finished for the 2018 season when it gets a little bit warmer. And yeah, feel free to reach out. We can do that. I'm going to take this video and I will save this. It'll go to my YouTube channel, which is also linked here on the Twitch page. So once that's uploaded to YouTube, we'll have that as a permanent record and anyone can access that anytime. Feel free to share it. Perfectly good. All right, everybody, I think that's going to be about our course. So we're finishing just under an hour, which is pretty good. I'm happy with that. It means we didn't waste anybody's time. We were efficient. We like efficiency here. And thank you all for coming to the class today. I hope you all got some good tips. I hope everybody learned a few things about how to build their own stuff. And I look forward to seeing what people build in the future. 
Have a great day, everybody. I'm going to shut this feed down now and go have some breakfast. I think you're going to do just fine. Uh, that, that suit shouldn't have any problems. The one thing I would suggest you do, that's a good point. We didn't talk about repairs. How do you do repairs? If you're building something that doesn't have rivets and you just laced it through, how do you do that? How do you repair that? It's a good question, and I'm glad you brought it up. So there's a couple of ways you can do that because I've had to do this in the past. If you snap this piece on the end and it pops out, what I like to do is pull it out back two or three. So if this sort of rivet, and this is usually where you're going to see a break. It's going to be one of these things will pop if it's going to. Pull it out two or three. Go back a couple of plates. And when you know where this bridge point in the back is, take another piece and just melt both ends and sort of put them together and pour some cold water on just a couple of drops. And you'll find you can fuse them together. It'll look kind of like this, actually, if I can get that up in the camera. And you can do that fuse and basically make a weld. What I would recommend you do, take a small piece of leather or another plate. Uh, leather with holes punched is more precise. If you want to burn a plate, you can do that too. Mount it on the back, like so. So that way it feeds through it and gives it that little bit of extra hold. And then you can put it back through and then pull it back out. So essentially you're welding a new piece of the plastic. You're melting the nylon onto the nylon. You can build a bridge, pull it through. You have a little piece of leather there to act as an interdictory force on that second or third. When it gets to the end now, when that pressure hits that, it's going to hit that leather first when it pulls on it again. And then you can melt and just build your standard rivet end just like that. So that's pretty much your, your, what you're going to find is your worst case scenario for repairs. I find usually it's when you get the bridging parts between shoulders. It's why I don't do straight lacing of plates to place when I'm going from a chest to a shoulder bridge. Uh, I can show you actually. We'll turn this suit inside out. What you see is if we're looking at the inside of a suit here, we actually have this separate piece of leather that I cut out and put the holes into. Specifically, that side's really sloppy, actually. This is a very early suit, so I apologize. This one's a lot cleaner. What you can see is, is that I have that other piece of leather there, which is really taking the workload between both sides. So that way, it's not getting undue stress on it. When you look at it from the front, it looks like just one nice connected seam. So that allows you flexibility and allows you some effort. Um, if I get the plastic suit out, I think that one might be a little easier to see if I can get it to flip inside out for me here today because I haven't completely undone it. <laughs> and this is a much larger suit because this is meant for me and I'm double the size of my wife. So if you look there, you can see that's a very clean, how we went and did that, how it just comes across on that top row. And there's only three riveted ends in that coming back down into that. And that's where the connection point is. So you don't have plates tugging on plates, putting undue stress. There's that leather with that little bit of flex to it. So if you ever have to do that sort of welding two pieces of nylon cord together, and again, this is why I said get that nylon, nylon power cord, not the nylon polyester. The nylon, nylon is much easier to work with when you have to do this. Now, as a note... For full disclosure, if you wanted to avoid that completely, get the Jiffy Rivets. You can go and take that and say, I've gotten to the end. I'm at a point where I'm getting to a shoulder point. I need to take this, put this on here, skip a row on the lacing, put your leather with the holes that you punched out with your hollow punches, slap a rivet into it. If you put that rivet in there, that rivet will hold. Now... Rivets do blow out and rivets do rust, but in terms of repair, it's much less involved to just knock that rivet out and pop another one back in. It happens more frequently, but it's that whole notion of are we building from a mechanical or an engineering standpoint? I, I like the more engineering side of it where I say I build it once and it lasts five years. I don't have to repair it, and when I do have to repair it, I have to invest some time and effort over the course of half an afternoon. Versus the mechanical point, which says, well, this might blow out every 7 to 12 months, but I can fix it in 10 minutes. 
your mileage varies. If you're playing a light to medium touch game like most LARPs, uh, an American lightest touch buffer LARP, which is using ultralight weapons, that shouldn't be happening unless you're running into trees. If you're playing a heavier game uh, in Canada, Bicolin, with the latex weapons, Germany, your festival LARPs like Drakenfest and such, they do tend to swing a little harder. And you're using the full latex weapons there, so they do have a little more hit to them. There's a lot more force behind them. They know they're trying to be light touch, but it's definitely heavier. Uh, an amped guard or a dagger here in the United States, which is using the full foam weapons, but does tend to swing a lot harder. You might see that happen. If you were using something like this for the SCA, which you can absolutely use the aluminum or steel for, no question, you're going to see blown rivets. That's a given. So that, that, that pretty much covers, I think, repairs and how I would do it. Again, there's a lot of different ways to do that. That is the way I would repair it. Does that cover everything you needed for repairs, Alopi, or did you have any other questions? I know we have a couple of people in chat right now, so if anyone has any other questions about build designs or styles or anything like that, I'm happy to answer it while you got me here. Grab my tea. All right. Well, if we don't have any other... Oh, here we go. There's such a delay here. I'm sorry. I think it covers everything. I'll send you a PM in case it didn't. Perfect. That's great. I am generally available. So grab that here. I'll put this up on YouTube for later. And yeah, guys, thank you for coming to the stream. Thanks for coming to the class. And if we have any questions later, I'm happy to go and do another on some more advanced things or more finished products. Have a great day, everybody.